60 Minutes Rewind. More than seven years have passed since a monster earthquake and tsunami struck northeast Japan and triggered what became, after Chernobyl, the worst nuclear disaster in history at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. When three of its six reactors melted down, hot fuel turned to molten lava and burned through steel walls and concrete floors. To this day, no one knows exactly where, inside the reactor buildings, the fuel is. And it is so deadly, no human can go inside to look for it. So the Japanese company that owns the crippled plant has turned to robots. There are four-legged robots, robots that climb stairs, and even robots that can swim into reactors flooded with water. They're equipped with 3D scanners, sensors, and cameras that map the terrain, measure radiation levels, and look for the missing fuel. This is part of a massive cleanup that's expected to cost nearly $200 billion and take decades. Has anything like this cleanup, in terms of the scope, ever happened before? No, this is a unique situation here that's never happened in human history. Uh, it's a challenge that uh, we've never had before. Lake Barrett is a nuclear engineer and former Department of Energy official who oversaw the cleanup of the worst nuclear accident in U.S. history, Three Mile Island. He was hired as a senior advisor by TEPCO, the Tokyo Electric Power Company that owns the plant and is in charge of the effort to find the missing fuel. He's also advising on the development of new robots, like this six-legged spider robot that engineers are designing to hang from scaffolding and climb onto equipment. He describes them as... Very advanced working robots that will actually be the ones with long muscular arms and uh, laser cutters and such that will go in and actually take the molten fuel and put it in an engineered canister and retrieve it. Should we think of this as a project like sending someone to the moon? It's even a bigger project in my view, but there's a will here to clean this up uh, as there was a will to put a man on the moon uh, and these engineering tasks can be done successful. Why not just bury this place? Why not do what they did at Chernobyl? Just cover it up, bury it, and just leave it here, all, in, you know, enclosed. Number one, this is right next to the sea. We're 100 yards from the ocean. We have typhoons here in Japan. This is also a high earthquake zone, uh, and there's going to be future earthquakes. So these are unknowns that the Japanese and no one wants to deal with. The earthquake that caused the meltdown measured 9.0, the most powerful ever recorded in Japan, and triggered a series of tsunami waves that swept away cars, houses, and entire towns, killing more than 15,000 people. At Fukushima Daiichi, the enormous waves washed over the plant, flooding the reactors, and knocking out power to the cooling pumps that had kept the reactor cores from overheating. Lake Barrett took us to a hill overlooking the reactors where the radiation levels are still relatively high. So this is actually right wh where it all happened, the heart of the disaster, right here. Correct. There's reactor number one, reactor number two, reactor number three, and when the earthquake happened 100 miles away, these buildings all shook, and these towers all shook. But the design was such that they were, they were safe. But 45 minutes later, waves were racing in, tsunami waves from the earthquake. And there were seven waves that came in at 45 feet high and put the station in what we call station blackout. They had no power, and the cores got hotter inside and hotter and hotter again until the uranium started to melt. How many tons of radioactive waste was developed here? Probably 500 to 1,000 tons in each building. So how long will it be lethal? It will be lethal for thousands of years. What we're talking about, really, is three meltdowns. Yes, it was truly hell on Earth. The meltdowns triggered huge explosions that sent plumes 
of radioactive debris into the atmosphere, forcing the evacuation of everyone within a 12-mile radius, about 160,000 people in all. Weeks later, TEPCO officials engaged in so-called kowtow diplomacy, allowing townspeople to berate them as they prostrated themselves in apology. Thousands of workers were sent to the countryside to decontaminate everything touched by radiation, including digging up dirt and putting it in bags, lots of bags. But while much of the evacuation zone has been decontaminated, there are still entire neighborhoods that are like ghost towns, silent and lifeless, with radiation levels that remain too high. At the plant, they're capturing contaminated groundwater, about 150 tons a day, and storing it in tanks as far as the eye can see. Water is always a major challenge here, and it's going to remain a major challenge for, until the entire cores are removed. The closer workers get to the reactors, the more protective gear they have to wear, as we discovered. <laughs> we were zipped into Tyvek coveralls and made to wear two pairs of socks and three pairs of gloves. OK, we're going to tape. Not an inch of skin was exposed. The layers of protection include a mask. It's a little loose. No, we're it up. That often fogged up. How are you feeling? Good. And a dosimeter to register the amount of radiation we'd be exposed to. We were ready for battle. We went with a team of TEPCO workers to Unit 3, one of the reactors that melted down on that March day seven years ago that the Japanese call simply 311. Mike. There you are, Unit 3. Oh, watch it. Step. These are shield plates because there's cesium in the ground. In the years since the accident, much of the damage to the building has been repaired. But it's still dangerous to spend a lot of time here. We could stay only 15 minutes. There's this number I've been seeing, 566. Six. Right. That's telling you the radiation level that we're in. It's fairly high here. That's why we're going to be here a short time. How close are you and I right this minute to the core? The melted cores are about 70 feet that way behind 70 the shield 70 feet walls. from here is the melted core? Correct. That's right over in here. We don't know quite where other than it fell down into the floor. So if you sent a worker in right now to find it, how long would they survive? No one is going to send a worker in there because they'd be overexposed in just a matter of seconds. Enter the robots. This is the robot research yes. center. This is for remote control technology development. In 2016, the Japanese government opened this $100 million research center near the plant where a new generation of robots is being developed by teams of engineers and scientists from the nation's top universities and tech companies. Dr. Kuniaki Kawabata is the center's principal researcher. This is the newest robot, the J11. So number 11. Yes. And what, it's, it's an obstacle course. Yes. The operators use the camera image in the front of the robot, but it's so many hours required to train because it looks very easy, but it's quite difficult. They also train here in this virtual reality room with 3D data taken inside the reactors by the robots is projected onto this screen. Operators using special glasses can go where no humans can. So we're actually walking through mm -hmm. a part of a mm -hmm. reactor. Mm -hmm. You feel some immersive experience. As if you're in there. Yes. I actually want to duck. I mean, that's how real it feels to me. Mm -hmm. Like, here we're going under this thing, I have to duck. Ah, uh, yes. The story will continue after this. But even with all the high-tech training and know-how, the robots have run into problems. For the early models, it was the intense levels of radiation that fried their electronics and cameras. Their lifetime was hours. We'd hoped it would be days, but it was for hours. Tell us what happened to the robot named Scorpion. So this is a highly sophisticated, and yeah. I gather everybody thought this was the answer. That was going to be the first 
robot we were going to put inside the containment vessel, which is where we need the information the most, because that's where the core is. This is Scorpion, whose mission cost an estimated $100 million. It was designed to flatten out and slither through narrow pipes and passageways on its way to the core. And like a scorpion, it raises its tail. The tail would come up with a camera on top with lights, because you have to have its own lights. It's all dark inside. There are no regular lights. So that was the plan. And we had great expectations and hope for that. We all did. It took a year to prepare, and it was hard work. But when Scorpion went inside, it hit some debris and got stuck after traveling less than 10 feet. I can't imagine the frustration lim levels. Well, but you'd learn more from, from failures sometimes than you do from successes. They had more success with this robot named Little Sunfish, which was designed to swim inside one of the reactors flooded with water. In preparing for Little Sunfish's mission, engineers spent months doing test runs inside this enormous simulation tank, fine-tuning the propellers, cameras, sensors, and 65 yards of electric cable, all built to withstand intense levels of radiation. They used nuclear reactor number five to help plan the mission. It didn't melt down when the tsunami hit, and is nearly identical to the one Little Sunfish would scout. Finally, last year, the swimming robot made its foray into the heart of the reactor to look for the missing fuel. Barrett took us into Unit 5 to show us how it maneuvered through the labyrinth of pipes and debris inside the reactor. The Little Sunfish came down on the edge and it swam underwater down through this little entryway here underneath the reactor vessel. Is this the route that the little sunfish took? Yes, this is. The little sunfish swam through this portal mm -hmm. down into this area. It went around the side. It went down through this grating, which was gone. We are standing directly underneath the reactor vessel. Molten fuel came through here, and it jetted out under very high pressure. And then it came out slowly like a lava in a volcano. And it fell down and burned its way through this grating down to the floor. This is what Little Sunfish saw as technicians guided it through the pipes and hatchways of the flooded interior. It beamed back images revealing clumps of debris, fuel rods, half-destroyed equipment, and murky glimpses of what looks like solidified lava, the first signs, TEPCO officials say, of the missing fuel. These robotic steps so far have been significant steps, but it is only a small step on a very, very long journey. And this is gonna take, you said decades, with a S. How yes. many decades? We don't know for sure. The goal here is 40, 30, 40 years. You know, I personally think it may be to 50, 60, but... Oh, maybe longer. Well, it may be longer, but reality is this is a challenge that's never been dealt with before. But every step is a positive step. You learn from that and you go forward to another step. 